Good evening. Welcome to Dateline Sarasota. I'm your host, Kerry Kirshner, and tonight is a very, very special program, not only for me, but for all of Sarasota, because tonight we have the premier event of the spring training season in Major League Baseball. No, we don't have a player from the major leagues, nor do we have an owner. We have Sarasota's native son, Buck O'Neill. Buck is a man who not only deserves pride and recognition from all Sarasotans, but for our, all Americans. Uh, Buck uh, was the chairman of the board of the Negro Baseball uh, Museum in Kansas City. He uh, is one of the people who decides who gets into the Hall of Fame in baseball in Cooperstown, New York, in the Veterans Committee. But most importantly, Buck is a man who is bringing honor, prestige, and recognition back to our town in his hometown, Sarasota, Florida. With me tonight is also a special guest, Donnie G from Sports Talk. So uh, we thought that tonight would be a lot of fun to double team Buck. Uh, if you will, I want to talk to him about what it was like to be here in Sarasota, and Donnie's got some real tough baseball questions to ask him. And of course, this is a live call-in talk show. The number is 371-2522, and you too can participate, so give us a call during the evening. Buck, welcome home, and congratulations. Good to be here, Kerry. We're really, uh, we're really proud and very happy that you, you were able to, to come back and, and be with us. It's uh, an honor, really. Well, uh, we, I know you've been back many times, Buck. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a lot of people, you know, I think had no idea who Buck O'Neill was until they saw the series on PBS with Ken Burns, and all of a sudden here's this man talking about how uh, he grew up in Sarasota and worked in the celery fields. And what was it like when your family moved here from Carabelle, Florida, in 1924? The boom was on, but uh, what, what was what was Sarasota like then? Well, and it, it, for me, well, in a kid from Carabelle coming to Sarasota, you know, Carabelle didn't have any paved streets. And I came up here and they had some paved streets in Sarasota. They had a lot of things in Sarasota that they didn't have in Carabelle. Carabelle being just a fishing village. But, uh, oh, it, and I came in here and uh, I'd never seen anything like it. And I loved it, really. I loved it and I loved being a boy here. Uh -huh. Had a wonderful time, made a lot of friends here in Kansas City. I mean, uh -huh, <laughs> yeah. here in Sarasota. Yeah. Buck, you know, as you look back on your time in Sarasota, just, you know, and, and I, and I want to hit you with, with a lot of questions. I know Donnie and I are both, we're just bubbling over mm -hmm. with things to talk to you about, and hopefully we'll be able to spend even more time with you as you're here during the week. But just quickly, what's your, one of your best memories of Sarasota? One of my best memory, memories of Sarasota, I believe, was meeting Emma Booker. Miss Emma Booker was the principal of uh, Booker Elementary School. And uh, she would sit and talk to us after school about what you could be, the different things, that the, the, the possibilities in the world that you didn't see right here in Sarasota. You don't see it now, but, but the things that would happen one day, Miss Booker could tell all of that and Miss Booker said to us said now you 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 can't go to Sarasota High School the only thing you can finish the eighth grade here say but I tell you what you can come to night school you can come to to summer school here and you can get an education and uh, prepare yourself to do something else this was Miss Booker uh, uh, most uh, one of the most wonderful people I've, I've ever known in my life hmm. Hmm. As, as, as you look back, one of the stories you tell in, on, on the series is, is your experience with Sarasota High School. I don't think a lot of people realize that there were very few educational opportunities for blacks in those days. Of course, because right here in, uh, in, in Sarasota, just in the state of Florida, only four high schools in the state of Florida for black kids, Miami, Tampa, Jacksonville, Pensacola. So you had a lot of kids that actually didn't get a chance to reach their potential, which was a horrible, horrible thing to have done to a mind. Right. Yeah. Share, share, share quickly that, that story that you told on, on TV. You were a box boy in the celery field. Yeah. Father was a foreman. And right out, right out Fruitsville Road, uh -huh. right out Fruitsville Road here at, at Palmer Farm, 
on right. Palmer Farm. I went out there okay. too. I'm going to ask you to hold the story because we're, we're going to go to a, to a quick uh, break. We seem to be having an audio problem, and we'll be right back after this message. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we ain't gonna worry about that. Fifteen seconds. Ten. That's not gonna do. We get the welcome. Message. Welcome back. Uh, sorry, we had some audio problems. We were in the in the process of Buck telling a story about working in the celery fields uh, that that he shared uh, with folks on the PBS series Baseball. Buck, uh, let's let's reflect back uh, working out Fruitville Road. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going out Fruitville Road and and, and working at Palmer Farm. And uh, my father was a foreman at at the farm, the celery farm. And I came out to get a job as a box boy. And uh, when they were hiring, I think it was about five kids there, wanted this job. And uh, the man talked to the people. His name, uh, 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 forget his name now, but anyway, he talked to this boy, this boy, and I was the last boy he talked to. And he said, why do you want to be the box boy? I said, I want to be the box boy because I tell you what, uh, Mac James was his name. I said, Mr. Mac James, I'm going to be the best damn box ball you ever saw. And he said, you got the job. So I got the job. And, uh, well, I worked out there and, and, and uh, been out there quite a while. But I was a good box boy. See, they put, uh, uh, the box boys usually have one box here, one box here. That's the crate to pack the celery in. But I was tall. I stacked the box on top of a box, so I took four boxes. So they were paying a dollar a day. And they paid me a dollar a quarter a day. I was a good box boy. But anyway, box the field, you know, a mile long. A celery a roll a mile long. And I got to stack boxes up and put boxes on this end, boxes on the middle, boxes on the other end. So I would line the boxes up. Nobody ever had to call box boy because I'd have the boxes there ready. But this day it was hot out there on Palmer Farm. And you know that muck hits you when it gets hot. And... Uh, the old folk, my, my father and other old men were on this side of my boxes eating at lunch. I was on the other side of the box eating lunch. And I said, damn, it's got to be something better than this. <laughs> now, I don't think my father heard me, but I, anyway, we get off the truck that night going home. He said, I heard what you said behind the boxes tonight, uh, today. I said, oh. I thought he was going to reprimand me for saying damn, see, because he's never heard me say damn. And I doubt if I was able to see a damn before, <laughs> but it was hot that day. He said, yeah, it's something better, but you're going to have to get away from here. I said, man, how you think I'm, how am I going to get away from here? He said, well, you're a good athlete, 
you play ball. And I uh, said, Lloyd Hayes is out at, uh, out at, out at uh, Booker School and said, uh, why don't you talk to Lloyd? Lloyd had gone to Edward Waters College, that's in Jacksonville. Talk to him and said, maybe you get a chance to go there. And uh, so I talked with Lloyd and Lloyd went and got Mrs. Booker. And they came out to my house and, uh, and uh, they called Coach Ox Clemens, Edward Waters College in Jacksonville. Edward Waters College is an AME school. That's African Methodist Episcopal Church. That is our faith. But anyway, they called him and, and uh, Ox said, you say, Ox, you say, I mean, Lloyd, you say he's a good ball player, said, uh, let me talk to Ms. Booker. And Ms. Yes, Ms. Booker said, Ms. Booker said, is he academically sound enough? She said, yes, he sure is, coach. He said, all right, send him up here. And actually, they sent me to Edward Walter, but the, 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 the main part of the story, I had worked for a guy, name was A. Roth. A. Roth was a German Jew. He had a, a, a shoe repair shop. I had worked for him shining shoes, and he was teaching me how to fix, repair shoes. And uh, when he found out that I was going off to college, he gave me $50. He gave me, that's a whole lot of money. Yeah. Gave me 50 He said, John, you take this and you're going to college. I'm glad you got a chance to go. All right. I went to Edward Waters and uh, did all right in Edward Waters, see, because I'm supposed to be in the ninth grade when I get there. Now, to show you what Miss Booker had done for me in summer school and, and night school, when I got there, I took the examination. They put me in the 11th grade. Huh. Yeah, that's what Miss Booker had done. And I, I, I had a good time in school, really enjoyed school very much at Edward Waters. So I, I did a couple of years, got my high school degree, diploma from Edward Waters. Had two years of college in Edward Waters. But I come back to Sarasota, and, uh, oh, man, I'm a big shot. That first year I came back, I'd been to college and all of this, see. And that's when I ran into Big Knox. We called him. Big Knox was a gambler and, and hustler around the street. But And uh, he liked me, and I liked Big Knox. And Big Knox wore a 12 shoe. I wore a 10. He gave me a pair of fluorescent shoes, black and pretty. I, I stuck, put cotton and newspaper in the toe of them, and I wore those shoes. Then they started calling me foots. <laughs> But anyway, that was big knocks. And I, so after I go to school and I, I come back home that summer, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm feeling good and chesty. So I go to Big Tex, had a cab stand and he had a dice game in the back of pool table and all. So I go in there and I had never been back there before. The men gambling, I'm going to shoot a little crap. And uh, I picked up the dice and put my money down and big knocks grabbed in the collar. Say, listen, we are in here doing this because we can't do any better. Say, you got a chance to do better. See, and if I ever catch a little black rump in here again, I'm going to kick it. <laughs> and I never went back there again. That's to show you how they felt about, you know, having a chance to improve yourself. Right. Yeah. Huh. Wonderful story. Wonderful mm -hmm. story. And, and from then, it... Uh, it was on to uh, semi-pro and professional yeah, yeah, baseball. Yeah, sure, sure. Huh. So that, but, that, but, that was but your start at town. Let's talk about the Negro League. I mean, the Negro League, you know, a lot of people are not that familiar with it. They mm -hmm. know that there was great athletes circa 1946 that were able to, when Jackie broke the barrier, fill in the Ernie's and the Willies mm -hmm. and the Larry Dobies, the yeah. Monty Irvins, the Don mm -hmm. Newcombs, the Campies. But the, I don't think the, the, the Negro League was not a barnstorming uh, exhibition type Harlem Globetrotters type league. It was sophisticated, well attended, and highly capable ball players. Yeah, Am I let correct? Me, let me tell you something about the Negro League that a lot of people didn't know. Very organized. See, see, Ruth Foster organized the Negro League in 1920. See, the, see, they had been playing just like you said, barnstorming old country, playing everything, going from hand to mouth and things like that, uh, sleeping on bus or sleeping anywhere they could sleep, on the railroad cars and all the things of that. But Rube thought if he organized, because he knew how good they could play, if they would organize, uh, they would have a chance
to play Major League Ball one day. And he was so far ahead of his time, this is 1920, he was thinking expansion. He thought that the National League would take a black team and the American League would take a black team. He was thinking that in 1920. That's why he organized. And when they organized, we traveled, they traveled on the train. They traveled on the train. They put a car on, they dine on for these ball players, and they traveled by train. But what the man that owned the Kansas City Monarchs named J.L. Wilkinson, J.L. Wilkinson, he saw, said, now, we're doing all right, but if we would do much better if instead of playing Chicago, uh, uh, Cleveland, uh, Columbus, these teams in our league, uh, uh, Memphis, Birmingham, see, we would go on the train and we'd go to these, these towns. He said, now, if we were in buses, we could play, say, two games That's in right. Kansas City. We'd play, now, say, say Sunday, a double hit in Kansas City. Monday, we could play in, uh, in St. Joe, Missouri. Tuesday, we could play in, in Omaha. Well, this is the way, and then he could make more money, and that's just what they did. But to show you how well organized it was, is I could tell my wife, we were going to spring training, I could tell her the hotel I was going to stay in, and as soon as I'm telling her this, and I could tell her the hotel I would be in Labor Day. That would be the end of the season. It was just organized, and... Helps to save a marriage, too. Of course, of course. <laughs> How many course. years have you been married, bud? Well, and I've been married married now 49 years, but uh, hey, I was 34 before I married. I was having such a good time single, man. I don't want to know about that. This <laughs> <laughs> is a family show, Buck. But you know what? I think you have to... <clears throat> we talked about this earlier. I think that when you went in to Yankee Stadium to play the Yankees, did you, did you, were you, did you feel confident? The black Yankees. Okay. No, oh, you know, because this was still, still, still a uh, 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 black and white issue. Okay. But did you ever play exhibitions against white major leaguers? Yeah, of course. Now, when you played exhibitions against white major leaguers, how did you fare? Your ball clubs? Better than the major leaguers fared. Now, now, not that. Now, don't, don't ever believe that we were better ball players than the major leaguers that we were playing for. The major league ball players were playing for one thing. This was after the season. This is some winner money for That's them. Exactly right. And a lot of them that played now, like with the Dizzy Dean All Stars, we play them for 30 days, or the or the Bobby Feller All Stars, we played 30 days. And those ball players would make more money, bonds down with us one month, than a lot of them made the whole season. Buck, that's a great, you know, you remember Virgil Fireball Trucks? Of course. Virgil Trucks told me that we were at the Otto Graham Golf Tournament. He said, we used to, we could, could not make enough money playing baseball. So we would go home and with our name, we'd sell insurance or that's sell right. cars. And a lot of us would hook up and we'd do barnstorming with the Negro teams. That's right. And he said, there was no question that they were at our level. Of course. And he said, I made more money yeah. doing that than I did playing baseball. See, and uh, why we won the majority of the ball games, the this is what they were playing for, to make that winner money, to make that extra money. We made the extra money too and loved it, but we were, we had a little pride that we wanted to prove to the world. See, the world said, without a doubt, these are the best baseball players in the world. They're major league. See? But... Black or white? But, no, no. These are, the major leagues were the best baseball players in the world, period. Okay. See? But we had to prove, we wanted to prove to the world that we were as good as the Major League Baseball players. So what actually happened, instead of just playing for that money we were going to make, we played a little harder. We slid a little harder. We took the extra base. You know, that didn't worry us. We wanted to prove it. And another thing, too, is a Major League would tell another, now, wait a minute, don't, don't, they don't need to hurt yourself here. Yeah, you know, that's don't right. need to hurt yourself. You're gonna come up here and sprain an ankle or something. You won't be able to go to spring training, or you might break a leg or something. But that didn't even come out of my mind. We were trying to prove that we were as good, and now, this is why we won the majority of those ball games. But you tried a little harder. But there was oh, more incentive right. for you. Uh, you have a question? I I just wanted. To, we were talking earlier, and you, Buck, brought up the point about playing in Yankee Stadium and. Uh, a lot of people, I don't think, realize that the Negro Leagues did play in the Major League ballparks. Of course. Uh, explain to folks how it worked, uh, you know, that uh, 
and and really the the economics of major league owners and why they like the the Negro League. That's it, one of the reasons I think kept us out of of Major League Baseball because actually the Yankees actually in a season just might have made a hundred thousand dollars off the, on Negro the of the Negro League. See because they had see. At, at, at New York, they had the New York Cubans who played in the That's Yankee right, Stadium. Yeah. They had the New York Black Yankees who played at Yankee Stadium. And we would take four teams that played four team doubleheaders. The Kansas City Monarchs, we would go New, we'd go east for two weeks. They would come west for two weeks uh, during that season. And when we would go east, we'd play the four team doubleheader at Yankee Stadium. Say the Kansas City Monarchs would be playing the New York Black Yankees, and the Chicago American Giants would be playing the Cubans. And, and so another team we would have, maybe the Birmingham Black Bands would be playing over at Bushwick's. And uh, the Memphis Red Sox would be playing right across the river there uh, uh, at, Newark. at Newark. See, so all of these teams would be in there in New York and we playing in the Major League Baseball Park. The Major League Baseball Park, we played them a percentage of the gate. We played them a percentage of the gate and they had all the concession. They had all the parking. This is the major league. And so actually, this would have cut off a lot of money from them had it been, uh, had it, it turned out to be when they integrated. It made a lot of difference. And I, I'm sure we kept uh, 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 Clark Griffith down in Washington with the Grays playing there. And oh man, we would pack that ballpark. We would pack that ballpark and just like everywhere we played, we packed the ballpark and over at the... And with, with as cheap as he was paying players, that must have been a real profitable for him. Of course. But, but yeah. economically, Buck, it wasn't really to their advantage to bring blacks into the major That's leagues. Right. It was That's an economic right. issue. It That's wasn't so much right. as a... But there had to come a time when somebody was going to make the move. I mean, and Branch Rickey, as we talked earlier, has gotten received most of the credit. Now, you talked to a, talk to a Virgil Fireball Trucks. Mm -hmm. He said it was an inevitable situation. It had to happen. Now, I believe you were in the Navy when uh, Jackie yeah. played at Kansas City. Yeah. Then I think he went, signed in 45, played for Montreal in 46, then went up in 47. That's right. What kind of pressure was on Jackie Robinson? Oh, man. It, 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 you can't explain it the amount of pressure that was on Jackie because, listen, when Jackie signed, we had several ball players were better than Jackie in that league at the time. That is, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. we well, had several uh, ball players that were 1946, better. you were the batting champion of the Negro Leagues, right? Yeah, but this was after I, I came right. out of the so Buck, Let me ask you this. Were they at the right age? In other words, you may have been better. Josh Gibson was probably better. Leon Day was probably better. But at that point in time, you were fin finalizing a career. Jackie was starting. Am I correct? Is that where you're coming from? Where I'm coming from is this. This is where I'm coming from. Jackie was the most logical one for the simple reason that Branch knew. If Branch had failed, if this experiment had failed, Branch would have been through in baseball. And it could have been 50 years more before another black. Now, we knew we had guys capable of playing, but the guys that I knew that could have played, I don't think they would have stood what Jackie stood. They wouldn't have stood because they wouldn't have known the meaning as Jackie knew it. Jackie knew if he had failed uh, morally, more or less. You know, First thing, uh, uh, Jackie, the worst thing could have happened to Jackie was Jackie would have gone with a white girl. That was the worst thing could have happened. And of course, a lot Jack of people Johnson said did. that would happen because that, that Johnson stigma was still there. Jack Johnson. See, and so actually some of the guys wouldn't have realized what Jackie realized and they might have committed that sin because that type thing was put in front of Jackie. The temptation was there. It, it was put in front of Jackie by design. By design. By design, because they wanted him to fail. They wanted him to fail, but, but he was too smart. He was too smart. Ricky was too smart. But Ricky, 
I, 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 I loved him. He had guts enough to do it. But it was a, now you're coming right back to finances again. Economics. That's right. This is America. You got the and Giants, you got the Yankees, and you got the Dodgers playing in the same town. That's right. And he needed, he needed, see, the Yankees didn't need no uh, nobody. See, but the Dodgers. Giants and the Dodgers needed somebody. See, but when they got, uh, they got Jackie over there with the, with the now you've got these people that we had been drawing at Yankee Stadium. You understand what I mean? These 35,000 people we putting in Yankee Stadium, now these people going to see Brooklyn play. What you're saying is blacks watch baseball. But Augie Bush once said, blacks drink beer, and yeah. I want them on my ball club. <laughs> but was there a jealousy factor? In other words, you're talking about highly competitive, highly uh, skilled athletes. All of a sudden, one comes out of the cuckoo's nest. One is mm -hmm. picked. Yeah. Now, I can't imagine the pressure on Jackie Robinson from both sides. Maybe the whites not wanting him to do well, and the blacks saying, well, you know, I'm better than he is. And like you said earlier, there were better ball players. Yeah. That had to be a very, very but, difficult position. No, no. But as far as the blacks were concerned, as far as the blacks were concerned, they say, if Jackie did it, if Jackie's playing there, oh, I'm better than Jackie. That's right. You know what I mean? I, that means it gives me a chance. But what... The, 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 the sad part of that, now that's the ball player that was really hurt. The ball player, the black ball player that was better than Jackie, he's 29, he's 30 years old. That's in the prime. That's yeah. in your prime. But the major leagues don't want him. The major leaguers, and now we don't want him either. Because the major league wanted young ball players. Say if a guy starts with me at 20, he's going to play 15 years. But if he starts with me at 30 years old, he's going to play three years or four years, and he's through. So he's, he's dead on the Negro League, uh, and he's dead on the White. Now he got to go to Cuba, uh, got to go to Canada, he got to go to South America, he got to go to Mexico, he got to go some. he got to leave home to go play ball. And this was a guy could really, they could really play. It really hurt those guys. See, it, that didn't hurt me. And guys like me, it didn't hurt, because I'm past that time anyway to play Major League Baseball, and, and I was fortunate enough to go stay in baseball. Let's, Donnie and I have discussed this before, Buck, and one of the phenomena that, that I didn't realize is it seemed like each team ended up with maybe one black pair. He, Donnie pointed out to me, Elston Howard came with the Yankees when in the late 40s. Mm -hmm. And yet there was not another black ball player on that Kerry, team. Kerry, that's a very good point. I mean, I'm going to let you talk about no, this. For but 10 or 12 years. And, and then you had, you know, you had Monty Irvin. You had Hank Aaron. You had, you had these, these fellows that, that, that got on the team. But then for many years, there weren't many more blacks that made it on the major league team. You had Satchel Paige, I guess, was with St. Louis for one year during the mm -hmm. war. And then he didn't go back to Cleveland until when, late 50s? He was with games? Cleveland. He was with yeah. Cleveland first. Oh, was it Cleveland first? Yeah, they and went then, to the Browns. then they yeah. went to the Browns. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, 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 what do you think this, I mean, was this, if you will, an experiment through the major leagues that they all were going to say, well, you know, we're, we're just going to have a couple of blacks on the team for 10 years or so? so mm -mm. Mm -mm. The, 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 the thinking was this, is, is uh, this is why, the National League had the ball players before the American League. Absolutely. See, you know what the American League had on their side? The New York Yankees. Yeah. See, the New York Yankees paid the salaries of a lot of ball players on other ball clubs. That I know, means, I that, I mean, no, no, I don't mean they played it, but the draw. Yeah, the draw. People would come out the and watch draw, the Yankees. The, the, the draw, the draw, wherever the Yankees played, you, yeah. you feel the ballpark. Buck, I grew up in Bradenton, and they let the school out for spring training when the when the Yankees came to town to play, play the Braves. You, the, all the schools were let out for that, that afternoon. That's right. Game. Well, and this was yeah. this was the yeah. Yankees. Yeah. This was the Yankees, yeah. and 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 the Yankees uh, 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 talking about saving franchise. That and that's the same thing happened. The Monarchs with Satchel Paige. Yeah. Uh, we saved franchises for every place we played, everybody was there. This is why we pitched Satchel every night, pitching one inning or something like that. Is that right? It was a natural draw. Satchel was the, they came to see Satchel. 
we're going to take a quick break again. And when we get back, I'd like you to talk about Satchel Paige because he, to me, was a mysterious hero. I always thought that, boy, if this guy ever pitched in the major leagues, he'd just burn up the leagues. He'd be a 35-game winner if there ever was one. Never possible. <laughs> so we're going to be right back. We're talking with Buck O'Neill. Give us a call. We're going to get to your phone calls in just a couple of minutes. Be right back. Welcome back. We're talking with Buck O'Neill tonight, uh, Sarasota's returning hero. Uh, in <laughs> fact, I want to tell you some of the things that are going to be taking place tomorrow, 10 o'clock, out at what used to be Twin Lakes. We're going to dedicate Buck O'Neill Field, and uh, everyone is welcome, and we encourage everybody to come out there. Uh, then on Thursday night at 7 o'clock at Sudikoff Hall up at New College, it's a night with Buck O'Neill. Uh, we've dug through the archives in Sarasota and we're bringing out old pictures of Sarasota and we're going to throw them up on the screen and have Buck tell about the Sarasota he knew uh, back in the 20s and 30s when he lived here. Then on Friday morning at 9 o'clock is, I think, the culmination of a great week for Buck. Uh, as Buck mentioned to you, uh, uh, he was a believer in education and uh, had he had his brothers, he would have graduated from Sarasota High School. Well, that wish is coming true. And uh, we're all going to be able to be a part of that ceremony when Buck gets his degree from Sarasota High School. And uh, that'll be 9 o'clock at Sarasota High School. And again, everybody's welcome to attend. Uh, Buck, when we went to the break, uh, you were going to tell us a little bit about Satchel Page. Uh, well, and that's, that's quite a story. You know, but, uh, uh, Satchel Page was an outstanding pitcher. Actually, one of the best pitchers I, 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 I've ever seen. And uh, he was quite a human being. Satchel Page was, I guess, when you say Satchel Page, you got to say Ruth, uh, two of the greatest showmen that ever lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they could sell the product, they could sell themselves, and they, they, they just made you love it. Now, I, 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 as far as, as Ruth is concerned, I don't think, uh, 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 I know you would uh, 
like for your son to to have accomplished the things that Ruth could hit the ball like Ruth or play baseball like Ruth, but you wouldn't want Ruth to be in your son's uh, uh, a role model. Yeah. No, of course <laughs> not. And and this is what I'm saying now about here. I think a lot of people. You look at uh, athletes and uh, the 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 celebrities to be your children's role model. No, you should be your children's role model. You should be your son's role model. Uh, 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 you should be your daughter's role model. Uh, not go to somebody else like that. Right. But uh, Satchel, oh man, he, he he was beautiful, really, and 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 was beautiful to talk to. And I tell you what, there's something about Satchel that that a few people will know is uh, this satchel. We were playing in Atlanta, Georgia, played Pastor Leon Park, played there that Sunday, and uh, we're going to Charleston to play the next night. And uh, we get to Charleston Monday, and we're too early for the room because people hadn't checked out the room, so, and uh, we're waiting, and satchel said he called me Nancy. He said, Nancy, said, uh, <laughs> come go with me. I said, okay, satchel. So we jumped in the car. I, I had an idea where he was going. So we go down to the harbor in, in Charleston. And he had a friend down there, had a little outboat motor. And we got in the boat and we went over to Drum Island. Drum Island is where they used to land the slaves. And so we were over there and we st stood over there about 30 minutes. And the man said, come on, I'm going to take you someplace else. Then they took us back to the harbor in, uh, in uh, Charleston. And then we went to the place where to auction off the slaves. And Satchel and I stood there maybe 15 minutes, not saying a word. And then Satchel said, uh, you know what, Nancy? Look like I've been here before. I said, me too, Satchel. Because what he was alluding to was the fact that uh, my grandfather or his great-grandmother could have been auctioned off right there where we were standing. This is a Satchel a little deeper than a lot of people thought. Hmm. Hmm. That's like the pay. Quite a character, wasn't it? Oh, the, the, man, good pitch. Hmm. Man, good pitch. Great. One, one of the other great stories that you tell about is, uh, again, as is, is Donnie po pointed out, sort of the economics of baseball. Uh, uh, share, share with our uh, viewers the story uh, of Jackie Robinson at the gas station. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we had played, uh, in, in this, this, this uh, the, the Monarchs had been going to this, this filling station in Oklahoma for 20 years and never going to the restroom at this filling station. And uh, this day, Hilton Smith told me this story. See, I'm in the service mm -hmm. when this happened. And uh, said, Jackie, get off the bus. And Jackie, the man put the holes in the, in, in the tank. And Jackie started toward the restroom. The man said, where are you going, boy? He said, I'm going to the restroom. He said, no, you know you can't go to that restroom, boy. Jackie said, take the hose out of the tank. And uh, well, the man thought about this, because we got a 50-gallon tank on this side, a 50-gallon <laughs> tank on that side. He ain't going to sell 50 gallons of gas to, to one <laughs> customer, 100 gallons of gas to one customer until we came back again. <laughs> he said, well, and i tell you what. You boys can go to the restroom, but don't stay long. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. That is terrific. Yeah. Donnie, you, you wanted to well, bring well, up. No, I, just want, I, I said a lot of people think that when Robinson crossed the, the river, the, the barrier, and broke it down, thanks to Branch Rickey, that all of a sudden the floodgates opened. That wasn't the case, mm -mm. though. Uh, we talked earlier, uh, the Red Sox. I'll give you an example. The first black that ever played on the Red Sox was in 1959. That's almost, uh, what? 12, 14 years after Jack, and it was Pumpsy Green. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Yankees find the dynasty really ended in 64 when the Cardinals came along and knocked them off. And it was because, I mean, El Elson Howard was the only black on the Yankees. Now we're talking 1964, Robinson's 1947. This wasn't just an op open up th the deal. Now the Cardinals were, had some great ball players, Brock and yeah, Flood, etc. Yeah. So I think a lot of people think. Uh, Buck, that this thing just happened by no. know, like with the, there was a lot of people that still held out. Yeah, and and one of the things too about the the, the ones that that didn't hold out, what happened? You would hire two ball players. That meant you'd hire two blacks because you had one black to sleep with the other black. That was before the thing got like it is now. A man gets a suite by himself, but then it, you had a roommate. 
And so they needed a black roommate for the ball player. So like Larry Doby might get Harry Suitcase Simpson. That's what somebody. They would just, that's that's what they were doing. But one thing about it is that but when you talk about uh uh the Dodgers or you talk about the Giants and you you talk about Cleveland, well you got different thinking people in the first place. See? That's right. You got Horace Stonham over there with the Giants and, and uh <clears throat> and you got Bill Vick, great promoter, over there with Cleveland. This is why they they thought that we've got the ball player. But the Yankees, the Yankees, didn't think they needed a black ball player. George Weiss. The the Yankees. The thing about it is, the Yankees filling up the ballpark. The Yankees filling up, filling up all the ballparks that they're going. And another thing too. They kept good ball players, white ball players. For that reason, if I would go into a room to sign a white boy, and the Yankee scout would go in that room to sign a ball player, and it didn't have to be me, it could be you. And you were working for the Dodgers, and the guy, the other scouts were working for the Yankees. You go in that room talking to that boy, and by them, you want him to play with the Dodgers. The, the Yankee scout would say, do you want your son to be playing over there with the Dodgers? Oh, that black boy is over there. I never thought about that. You that's understand great, what I mean? That's a great and the, and, 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 and uh, they would the Yankee, use, uh, Yankee say, and, and, and he said, I'm going to give you as much, and you, you're going to be, be, be over there playing with them white boys. See? And so, you know what the mama going to say? Yeah, you're going to the Yankees, boy. That's just the way it, that's just the way it was. And but. It worked the other way too, cause I could go in there. We be trying trying to sign a black boy, and uh, the Yankee scout would come in here, and I would be in there. The Yankee scout didn't have a chance. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I said, in a million I years. Said, he didn't have a chance. I said, well, well, look here, man. Say, 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 brother. I say, you got to sign this boy with the Cubs. You know what I mean? We got Ernie Banks over there with the Cubs. We got Lou Brock over there with the Cubs. You should go sign this boy with the Cubs. And I said, Yankees ain't got nobody. Elson had to be lonely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <wasn't it? laughs> but you know what? It was the death knell for the Negro League, wasn't it, though? Once, of course. Once, once of course. It, it of really course. basically ended. Yeah, well, and it, it, we, we still drew well until, uh, I guess, around 50. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And, and the early 50s. When did the Negro League actually fold? But well, in the Negro League, probably around 58. And they still played out there, but you got about two or three teams playing. It was all gone. You didn't have a commissioner. You didn't have nothing then. Mm -hmm. Just some guys playing out there, and they, you know, with this name. But it it, it was gone. It was mm -hmm. gone because when we 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 started, what actually happened is now all of the good ball players that we had, they were older ball players. So we got rid of them. Now we're signing the 18 and 19 year old. We aren't thinking about winning no more. What we're thinking about now is somebody to sell. We are developing ball players. Yeah. You become a feeder system now. That's right. That's right. That's right. right. So yeah. this is this is just. But what would it have been to the I got to stop you. That? For huh? Would it have been to the benefit of the major leagues to continue the Negro League as a feeder, like uh, Kerry just said? No, no. For the simple reason, why give us anything? Economics. When, well, why give us anything when they now their scouts can go to these high schools and these colleges where we've been getting these black ball players from? Why why come through us? Good point. You understand yeah. what I mean? Yeah. yeah. What Economics. What you talking about? Okay. We've got people on the phone lines. We're gonna get right to your calls as soon as we turn from this break. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. This is the Buck O'Neill Show. This is the Buck O'Neill Week in Sarasota. Buck not only is uh, Sarasota's hero, uh, but uh, he was also the first black man to be a coach in Major League Baseball. And with that little piece of trivia, we're going to go right to the phone lines. Doug. Garrett. Yeah. I uh, want to applaud Mr. O'Neill and you, and we are a long time coming in including this gentleman uh, for his uh, contributions to baseball and contributions to Sarasota. Um, I have a quick question is, in your expertise, how can we help the kids who are in the black community who are excelling in sport and yet have this drive to go towards uh, either drugs or substance abuse and things like that on the street corner, how can we help them keep them off the street? Can we? Can we do anything by coordinating all of our sports efforts uh, to be just better citizens? Yeah. Good question, Doug. Yeah, we, we and, right and Mr. O'Neill, you are without a doubt the leader. Uh, you, you taught this city how to be a good, good person. Well, and that, the one thing about it is I had, uh, I had advantage, the advantage that a lot of these kids don't have. I had an outstanding father and mother and grandmother. I had uh, a leadership that a lot of these kids, that these problem kids that you, you're talking about, that they, they are having problems. If we can actually, we can keep these kids in school. We can keep them in school. If we can keep the girls from, stop them from having kids when they're 12 years old or 13 years old. If we can stop these type things, then we can stop the other things because actually right now in uh, say Newtown, the, the role model just might be a dope pusher because that's the man with the money. That's the man with the big automobile and things like that. These are the things, but at, in my era, you know, the the role model was uh, uh, Miss Booker, uh, uh, right. uh, uh, Cressy Hall, uh, Ethel Reed. These were role models. Uh, 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 Lloyd Hazley. These were role models in our our community. These are the things that these kids don't have. There was a real sense of community here, wasn't? Was it had to book? be. I mean, I mean, you know, it was it was a hometown feeling where everybody looked out for everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, uh, uh, Fred Atkins, uh, who you know was our first black mayor. Fred once told me. He said, "You know, Kerry." He said, "When when I was a boy, and he said, and I messed up. The woman next door, she got on me right away. And then when my mother got home, my mother got on me. Yeah. And he said, today, she said that woman next door is locking herself in the house because she's afraid. Yeah. She's not getting involved. Well, and that 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 came from that came all the way from slavery. That 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 that." Uh, the community raised the children. Mm -hmm. Mr. O'Neill, we have buck. created... It's not this. just a black problem today. I know. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not a black problem. We've created such great athletes out of Booker, out of Southeast, out of, out of all these schools, and, and some of them come into such, you know, real personal problems. And you are such a great role model. I mean, you are, you are an example of, of what can be done, and we can do it here in this community. Well, um, thanks for your call, Doug. Okay, let's go to Mike. Yeah. Yeah, Mike. Uh, yeah, first, I want to tell you, Kerry, uh, uh, that uh, Buck O'Neill is the best guest you ever had on there, and I hope Donnie G uh, gets him on there sometime. Now <laughs> well, I got a sir. couple comments to make, and then I'll hang up. Okay. Uh, you know, I agree with Buck that uh, uh, Jackie Robinson wasn't the best colored ball player in the Negro Leagues, and. Uh, it was through Branch Rickey that uh, they broke that colored line and stuff like that there. But uh, anyway, uh, I watched many of uh, ball games. Maybe Bucker remember too, uh, where he played out at uh, Redbird Stadium in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. I was a Triple A baseball player at uh, at Columbus. But oh, anyway, uh, I heard Donnie G make a comment, and I want to get Buck's answer on this. Donnie G said last week, I think, on his program that these, these ball players up there playing uh, uh, strike breakers or whatever you want to call them, they wasn't as good as the major league ball players. I'm going to tell you something. These ball players now, they break into the big leagues now uh, just batting 200 or 220 and making over a million dollars. And back in our time, uh, there was a lot of good ball players back there then. 
and they didn't get to the major leagues unless they hit about 300 or better. And uh, I want to hear Buck's uh, comment on that. Okay. Well, it, it, okay. Thanks, Mike. Bye. Mike, it, 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 it was actually, how old are you, Mike? Uh, he's off the line. Uh-oh. Well, in that, see, in that era, Mike, the supply was greater than the demand. We had so many ball players. The best athletes in the world were playing, uh, playing baseball. But right now, Mike, uh, uh, the best athlete just might not be playing baseball. One of the best athletes in the world, he's playing a little baseball now. He, he was right out of his White Sox park until he went home. And, and so this is the big difference. We got at one time in my era, we got the best athletes. Right now, we are getting who the other people leave. Your point, I think, is so well taken, Buck, and it, just as the add-on is, there was no money at all in professional football. There was no money at all in professional basketball. Mm -hmm. Baseball was the only Kids. place as, a, as an athlete that That's you right. could make a living. Uh, That's right. You dreamed to be a baseball player. Of course. And a lot of other kids did, too. Of course. In 1946, if you wanted to play in the major leagues, you had to be white, and there's only 336 jobs available. That's right. And what did Ted Williams say? 1920 to 1960. That was the golden age, and you were a part of it. Yeah. You're so fortunate. Buck, yeah. we, we, we look ahead to tomorrow and the rest of the week. Okay. Uh, share with us some of the people uh, who are still here in Sarasota that you played ball with. Uh, when you were with the Sarasota Tigers, the semi-pro team. Mm -hmm. Well, and a lot of them that I played with gone now. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. They passed. But I played here with Carlos Suarez. I played here with uh, uh, Fats Major, Dobie Major. These are guys I played with here that's still living. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But uh, some of the old-timers, the Red Fox, uh, 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 Red Sox, rather, and... Uh, Oh, Blue Yarbor. These guys could really play uh, uh, modern, pepper modern. They were outstanding ball players. And every guy that I named could have played with the Kansas City Monarchs, could have played with the Homestead Grays. But one thing, I was fortunate enough that I got the chance to play with them. Right. But it, 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 it just wasn't a job open for them. That was the reason that they didn't get a chance to play. Mm -hmm. Your, your mother worked for uh, the Ringling family. She worked for Ida North. She did, yes, yeah. sir. Uh -huh. She yeah. worked, for, worked for Mrs. North at one time. And when I went off to school, when I went off to school, Mrs. North gave me two suits that, uh, that uh, 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 her husband wore. I had to cut them down because he's a big man. Right. I cut them down and, and, uh, and to fit me, but that's what she did. Well, certainly there's, there's a lot of John Ringling in you, Buck, and, and uh, we're certainly happy to have you as, as our hometown hero and, and happy to be here in Sarasota. And uh, uh, I want to thank you for, for coming here and being with us. And, Had a wonderful and, time. And, and, we, and well, we look forward to pleasure. a great week. And uh -huh. Donnie G., I thank you for being here with us uh, as well. It's my pleasure, Kerry. Thanks uh, for inviting me. Again, what's going to take place the rest of this week, uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning uh, out at uh, Twin Lakes Park. It's going to be the dedication ceremony. Everybody's invited. Buck's going to be there, and I'm sure going to have some great stories to tell all of us. Thursday night, uh, it's going to be Thursday night with Buck O'Neill at Sudikoff Hall at University of South Florida. Again, free to the public. Uh, old slides, and Buck's going to tell us uh, more stories about Sarasota. And then Friday morning, 9 o'clock, Sarasota High School. We're going to have graduation, Buck's graduation at Sarasota High School. It's an event not to be missed. It is the premier occasion of Major League Baseball in Sarasota this spring, 1995. So for Buck and Donnie G and myself, have a good week, and we'll see you next week right here, Channel 36, Dateline Sarasota. And we'll see you tomorrow, 10 o'clock, right out of Twin Lakes Park, the new Buck O'Neill Stadium. All right. Good night. See All you right. next week. Good night.
there's change, but it's inevitable. Yeah, well, it, yes, but there's change, and then and there's change. Uh, take First Union Bank. Very, very aggressive bank, going after growth big time. And I, as a businessman, I like that. But they're conservative, too, because they don't buy what they can't pay for. And for somebody who's going to be retiring in a few years, I like that. We like that. First Union Bank, give them a call. Might be the most aggressive conservative bank you've ever come across. This is Comcast Cable Channel 4, Sarasota, Venice, and the beaches. And now, the host of Southern Gospel Live, Mark Ferguson. Welcome to another exciting...